Greetings from Podcastville. The Church of What's Happening Now is brought to you by Robinhood. Robinhood is an investing app that lets you buy and sell stocks, ETFs, options, cryptos, all commission-free. They strive to make financial services work for everyone, not just the wealthy. Let me tell you something. I love Robinhood. Why? Because the app is very easy to use. There's no commission fees. And I'll tell you, you learn how to invest as you build your portfolio. And that's the most important thing. Now, right now, for the church family, Robinhood is giving our listeners a free, you ready for this one? A free stock like Apple for the Sprint to help build your portfolio. Sign up at churchrobinhood.com. That's church.robinhood.com. Again, that's church.robinhood.com. The Church of What's Happened Now is also brought to you by Hymns. 66% of men lose their hair by the age of 35. The thing is, when you start to notice hair loss, it's too late. It's easier to keep the hair you have than to replace the hair you've lost. What we do at Hims is this. Hims connects you with real doctors and medical-grade solutions to treat hair loss. Well-known generic equivalents of name-brand prescriptions to help you keep your hair. What I'm going to do is this, okay? No drama, no nothing. You order today. The church family gets a trial, a free trial month of Hims for $5. $5 right now while supplies last. See the website for full details. This would cost you hundreds if you went to a doctor or pharmacy. I'm telling you right now. But go to 4hymns.com slash Joey. Listen, you're losing your hair. Let's keep what you have. I'm 55. I got a little bald spot. It's nice. But you guys are young. Keep your hair. Look sharp. You want to be out there. You want to be dating. This is the way to go. So do me a favor. Go for 4hymns.com slash Joey. And get a trial month of $5. That's 4hims.com slash Joey. Take that motherfucking mule leap. Fuck yeah, I ordered that book. Someone who knows Mrs. Obama has to listen to this book. <laughs> I swear to God, I got a crush on Mrs. Obama. She gained, a lot, she gained like 10 pounds. I don't care. I think but she's, she's looking fine. good in those polyester suits. She's fine. <laughs> you see her on fucking Good Morning America? Oh my God, she looks good. Oh my God. What's happening, you bad motherfuckers? Thursday morning, the man, the legend himself, Mr. Ryan Sickler. Straight out of Baltimore before the fucking wire. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he lit the wire. This motherfucker lit the wire and left. <laughs> Thank you for having me on. What's man. going on, brother? Good to see you. It's good to see you, dude. You know, for, this is what I want to say first before I say anything about myself. I watched your Degenerate special. Thank I thought you. it was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, and I don't want to blow your cover, but a lot of people know this, and some people maybe they don't. You're the nicest fucking guy like you really care about people i tell everybody like joey diaz you see that guy on stage that's that dude but you know what that dude also does calls you call not text you call how you doing right every time you're checking on me all the time man i can't thank you enough for you it you're, to your friends bro. you're great though a lot of people don't do that you're really good at it listen so. man i'm sick and tired of you're people a sweetheart I have no friends you're a, you got a lot you, of friends you don't you don't friendship doesn't come because you're such a nice guy either you could have millions of dollars and buy your friends or you could earn people's friendship and one way one way to earn people's friendship is when the peanut butter jar broke the peanut butter <laughs> on the floor your kids yelling you're late for an audition you're going crazy and also the phone rings and somebody just doesn't want something from you they just call you to go hey man I was thinking about you. It's so nice. Right there in that moment, even though everything's going on, for somebody to say, dog, the other night at the comedy store, I saw you and I forgot to tell you, your set was brilliant. You know, sat, something about Saturday night. <clears throat> A couple weeks ago, I went up there and uh, who's the guy that had the show when we first started comedy with the long hair? Tom Rhodes was up before. Yeah. Brilliant. The set he did was brilliant. Tom's great. It took me five days to remember to call him and call him. And I go, hey, man, I'm calling you to say hello, but I'm calling you to say that your set the other night was brilliant. That comedians don't, humans don't have that no more. When I get a text message that says happy birthday or happy Thanksgiving <laughs> or Merry Christmas. That I'm guilty of it too. I want to so. call you up and say, you know what? I hope your mother gets hit by an Amtrak. <laughs> because you got to know she raised you the wrong way. Uh, Don't truth, you fucking though. text me Merry Holidays. 
You pick up that phone and you don't call. Don't even bother. Don't waste your time. I want to hear your voice. I want to know what you're feeling. I'm friends with you. I know what makes you tick. I, I think it's beautiful. And if you don't do that, you're not going to have friends. Everybody wants to have friends, but everybody wants to have friends. I want to have a friend that if I stab a motherfucker, my wife says, Ryan Sickler called. Your bell is a half a mil, but he's got 25 that he can lend you till you get out and do a benefit. You know? Um, you go, on you, yeah. There you go. Mm -hmm. That's not friends. Those aren't the same people that come to your birthday party at La Mirage. And, yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, my God. To a wonderful man, let's raise our champagne yeah, right. glasses. That don't, don't happen. That's only in the movies. Yeah. If that's what you're looking for, you're going to die with nobody. You're going to die alone because those people only come when your pockets are full. They're not going to be there when your pockets are empty. I look at how many people are were around me when my pockets were empty and I was struggling in comedy, and I look at where they are. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Those people now come to the shows and juries. Like last week I did Gotham. I saw people there that I used to make go to open mics. You know when they make you bring four people? Yeah. There were kids in that crew that I would bring to those things. <laughs> like 20 years ago. Like, really? Oh, you got to do me a big favor. Before you go to the city tonight, stop at Stand Up New York. And just pay for a ticket. It's eight bucks. And they would go, for you, I'll do it. And they would bring, like, six of them would show up. And they'd spend 600 at the bar. And they'd be snorting in the bathroom. And then the, the club owner would go, listen, you can come here whenever you want. As long as your friends come. Because <laughs> they'd spend four or five hundred yeah, right, at the yeah, bar. Right. I still talk to those people. You know, those people were there when, when I was doing open mics. Dude. I'm still friends with guys from elementary school. I'm still strong, we're good friends with guys from elementary school, middle school, and high school. There's a couple college people, but the core of my friends back home, and I, and I see every every time I go home, I see a good chunk of them. You know, everybody's got kids and things now, but still, we still have to make time to get together. But they're all from back in the day, all of them. And every day I go, I got to call this guy. And it'll take me three days to call him, but in the meantime, I'll call other people. It'll take me three days to go. I got to call this fucking guy. Wait a second. This guy works nights. I'll call <laughs> yeah, him on my right. way to the comedy store. Right. On my drive. Yeah. You know, Timmy works nights. But I'm that's beyond considering company. someone. It's also their schedule and when you can actually think you got a shot at getting a hold of them instead of just throwing on a voicemail that no one listens to anymore anyway. You know what I mean? Like, remember when it used to be like you had to be somewhere to get that fucking call you had to be right here to get this call then it came call wait and you were like oh my god two people think enough of me to call me at the same fucking time like holy shit hang on a second then you got the answer machine it was like let's listen to this message now i see people on their phone with 300 missed fucking calls and and 80 voicemails i'm like what the fuck happened what happened i don't know if you guys have run into this it blew my mind just because i grew up on the phone not <coughs> there's a lot of people especially my age and a little bit younger who say they get anxiety about being on the flight? Like they don't want it. They they won't make calls to anybody. That I mean, that that doesn't make sense to me. But I, I people can get anxiety about anything, I guess. But I like the personal aspect of life. I think that if you don't want it in your life, you don't have to have it. For me, I prefer that contact. You know, I like talking to my uh, to my friends I grew up with instead of talking to these people in L.A. and like. You could do so much in L.A. to have people in your corner that say yes to you. Yeah. You could hire four people and have a big uh, payroll and everybody saying yes to you and getting your coffee and you could yell and make scenes and he's having a bad day. To, who gives a fuck? You know, what keeps me grounded is in the morning when I call one of my buddies from high school. And like I told Brody Stevens, they're delivering a FedEx package. And they're making twelve fifty an hour at fifty five, and they're running up and downstairs. And I go to a comedy main room on a Tuesday and pick up three hundred dollars or something like that, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'm sick thinking to myself, it 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 brings my, it levels me. It, it does. It's me, a balance. You know? Yeah. We've uh, years ago, 10, 12, 13 years ago, a company on a company ran a, ran a commercial, and it's a sales force. And the guy walks back in, and he starts giving everybody a plane ticket. Lee Syatt, here you go. Ryan Sickler, here you go. Tony Bananas, here you go. Johnny Gumbad, here you go. And they're all looking at their plane tickets. And he goes, ladies and gentlemen, I looked at the stats of the company, and I looked at the national stats. Sales are down. 
because we do everything on these stages. Like, this is a commercial. And he goes, we're going back out there, talking to people, and we're going to get back in people's faces. That's how you sell accounts. Good luck, gentlemen. And they were, like, looking around, like, at each other. And it said, like, the name of the company, if their salesmen make account. But it's true. We've forgotten <coughs> all those personal little things. That personal and I learned those little away. things when I sold cars. I was two things. Guess what I used to do a lot? A lot more than I do now. I was a letter writer. You were? I loved writing letters. To who? Wh whoever. You would do it for someone? Like I could no, say, no, hey, no, no, oh, no, okay. No, no, no. This is you had pen pals? This is contact. This prison was, inmates? Yeah, I was going to say, I'm not, I'm not trying to make a joke. Was it be from you being in prison? No, this was something that I learned from a guy named Carmine Balzano. When, <laughs> I, when I was growing up. Such a this, great, this guy that is the caught, most Italian fucking this thing. This guy got caught with machine guns. <laughs> this guy got caught with fucking, you know, uh, not paying parking tickets, ripping tickets up. Like you'd come to him and go, I got $1,000 in tickets, and he'd rip them up. <laughs> this guy lived corruption. But what he did was write letters to editors. And he would get his stories always printed. He was a letter writer. And I would look at that, and he'd always say the, uh, the pen is mightier than the sword, sword sometimes. You know, he'd, oh, he'd say in his words, sometimes the pen is mightier than the gun. You know, like he was a, he was a cop. And something, uh, he did something. Just, I got into writing letters. And if somebody did something, like uh, Timmy Holloway put up some pictures of me the other day. And he goes, he asked his father, where'd you get these pictures from? And he goes, after Coco left, he wrote us a letter to thank us for everything we had done for him. And he included those pictures. He was fine. I was a letter writer. I love sending out letters. But when you go to j prison, when you go before a judge, before I went in front of that judge, I wrote that judge 15 letters. <coughs> you did? Oh, yeah. Talking about what? What happened, what my situation was, what I learned from it. You know, but the probation report said I still didn't have any empathy. Like, I wasn't taking responsibility for the situation. But I built a relationship way before I went in there. And once he sentenced me, I wrote him letters in prison. You did? Thank you. Was it a lenient? Was it more of a lenient sentence because you had established that connection with him? He told me that I could, my lawyer could set a motion for reconsideration in 90 days. Wow. That means it's a good judge yeah, too, though. That's a good judge because that guy could have been like, "Fuck this guy." I also had a friend of mine that was his brother was a dentist, and my friend was best friends with that dentist, and he went to him and played golf with him. So I reached out to that guy to reach out to the dentist. You hit every angle. And the, on the dentist judge. said to him, "He goes, I've never done this for anybody else, but I'll do it for you because it seems like you really like the kid." So he talked to the judge. So because he did that, I kept in touch with that judge. For years, I got sentenced in 88, and I was still writing letters to that judge in 92, <laughs> 93. Oh, yeah, I'm a savage. Uh, you are. I was out of the system. I had no reason to write yeah. him a letter, but I would still write him letters. And one day I got in trouble, and I got taken to civil court by my ex-wife, and who was the judge? No. Come on. And I'm writing them letters about our situation. She's not letting me see the baby. I don't know what to do. He's not replying. Right. But he's getting these But letters. he knows, and he's reading them, you too. You follow me? Sure, yeah, they read uh -huh. them. You got to remember, when you're a judge, you want to move up politically. So when a person dies, the funeral parlor makes 250 mass cards. That means that every time I come in contact with Ryan Sickler, if I treat Ryan Sickler the wrong way, he's going to tell 250 people that Joey Diaz is a dick. Or at least I add to deck. You have to assume that when you run in, when you have contact with somebody, their, their reach is two fifty. Their reach is two fifty. So when you go up in front of a judge, and you're going up there, let's say for manslaughter, and you did plead out, and you there was mitigating circumstances. And let's I'm say, getting nervous just thinking about being in front of a judge for manslaughter say, right now. Lee. Let's say you negotiate with your attorney. Zero to nine years. The judge could give you anything zero to nine years. Mm -hmm. If I show up into that courtroom with 20 people to all talk on my behalf. And they're allowed to get up and speak? What's 20 times 250? <laughs> Let's see. Uh, yes. 25, 5,000. So that judge, instead of giving me nine years, is going to give me six and a half. That's great. 
That's how you have to work. Did you? And did that? Did it help you out in that civil case? It did benefit. Oh yeah, he yeah. told the next time you come up in here, and you don't give him the kid, I'm gonna find you a thousand bucks and throw you in jail for contempt. <laughs> she fucking turned red. Son of a bitch just got carpal oh, tunnel over there. Ever fucking was, write me so much. It was funny because I was telling. <laughs> uh, last night I took my jiu-jitsu teacher to the comedy store. And yes, the last since Jersey, I've been writing it a lot again in the book. And I thought about the story that was fucking cr- when I, whenever I go to New York and perform, <clears throat> I swear to God, I always see this kid that I grew up with, and he just waves at me. And one time in Jersey, I looked at him and I double looked at him, and I'm like, I know this guy. And I went over and gave him a hug, but he didn't want to take a picture. He didn't even want to talk. And then I saw him again in New York. Then I saw him again last last summer in the Borgata. Just by accident? I I always just see him. And really? He, and he just waves. He's like an extra in your life. Yeah, like an extra in my life. Yeah. But there's more to the story. I was very good friends with him and his family growing up. I see. He had two other brothers. One was a wrestler, and the other one was a gangster. The wrestler I sold ups to. Black <laughs> beauties. Gotta they drop had a, that they weight, gotta make man. weight. He, <laughs> since their last name started with a D, I became friends with him in homeroom. And gotcha. he was dear friends with a dear friend of mine. And I loved this kid like a brother, and he loved me like a brother. I used to go to his house. But throughout the years, my relationship with the younger brother selling them the pills, he, this kid knew he wanted to be a cop when he was 10. So he would tell me to stay away from his older brother. But his older brother made me 25 G's when I was 17 one time, handed it to me in an envelope. I love 25 grand 20, at 17? 25, 20 grand <sighs> in $20 bills. Oh. It was a fucking two rubber bands stacked together. Fresh bills out of a bank. He robbed the bank? No, 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 no. Was, uh, at that time, he was already in with these good gotcha. dudes. And he used to, this was crazy. This was crazy. I went to him and said, can you do this? And he was a drive to through teller. Okay, yeah. I so, remember that he put the, the tube in. The- so there, there was two checks. <laughs> yeah. He goes, I'll do it, but I got to keep one. You keep the other one. You keep the higher one. I'll keep the low one. That was his way with it. And then later on, he became, he grew in the bank. Even though he was involved with a crime family, he grew in this bank. And then in the early 80s, when everybody wanted to be a drug dealer, he would take money out of a vault on a Friday at 3 and give it to you. Like he'd give you 60 for 85000 But you better have that money back Sunday night at 9 o'clock. Because he had that was his bank family behind. Yeah. He would take money out of the vault. <sighs> That's give it nuts. To, to pick up two or three kilos <laughs> That's to move them. Nuts. And he'd take a percentage of your earnings. But I mean, he that's what he would give you sixty <laughs> for eighty five. All he's taking that sixty shit. for eighty five, and nobody do nothing. And they never got caught. Never got caught. Holy he never got caught. Shit. Everyone was and always there good was with a the loan money. Shark, then. then there was a loan shark that I would borrow from. I was into him for thousands because <laughs> I would go up to him and say, "You know, Ryan Sticker, yeah, I'm a good kid comes to the bar. He knocked up his girlfriend. He needs to get an abortion. He's five hundred. He doesn't want to ask you, so you wouldn't even know you were taking a loan out from the guy." <laughs> I'm paying him big on the money. I I'm getting him. beat down two months later, so, not even knowing why. So because, <laughs> so because I was going up me. to him as like the go-between, uh, yeah. he was giving me 10% anyway. Oh, shit. So he thought I was giving you the loan. So you're getting 10% on your own loan from that he thinks is my fucking money. Because and when you don't back. pay that and back, you he are, ain't coming to you. And there you are at the bar drinking, having a good time. He'd be sitting there <laughs> fucking bad across watching the back. you. No, yeah. he'd be there watching you, and you'd be buying drinks for people. No, Salud. no, on his money. Oh, yeah, on his money. hilarious. <laughs> I had one kid that owed him like forty grand. He didn't even know it. That's insane. And after I left, he was he would go in there and shoot pool, and that's when the guy went up to him and they said, "Doug, where's my forty? Oh, what are you God. talking about?" So now me and him were wanted by this guy. <laughs> so I leave. I, I leave. This for, started with him being a great friend. Uh, He's the number one friend in the world. <laughs> I leave for nine months. I come back. And this bar is still the hot spot in North Bergen. It's called Joe Mary's. <laughs> and, the, and the owner owns it. And he lives upstairs, the loan shark. But over the year, I heard that he got sick and he wasn't in the bar a lot. 
I'll never forget this. So there's a front door and there's a back door. And there's a bunch of people shooting pool. I, I, me and Stinky, the guy that I told him that I borrowed the 40 grand <laughs> yeah. from, we're walking back to the door, like tiptoeing, and we knock on the back door, and we're like, is George in there? And the guys that are shooting pool are like, what? They're like, come in, and we're like, is George in there? And they're like, no, and all of a sudden you hear, no, George is up here. And we looked up, oh. and George is right, he goes, how you guys doing? I haven't seen you in a while, I hope you have some money for me. And we're like, we do, George, come on down. And he goes, I'll be right down. And he closed the window, and we just oh. took off running. <laughs> And I just never saw George the fucking loan shark. Again. What year is this, by the way? Eighty three. Ah! So forty thousand, like eighty thousand. Like what is it? Oh, he's dead. He was sixty. Well, no, I know, I know. You don't owe him now. I'm just saying, uh, like uh, it's a lot of it's there, a lot of money now. There's a guy out there that was him two hundred fifty thousand that Joey had on him somewhere. Dude, never. Oh even my knew. god, it was fucking hilarious. Oh hey, god. can I promote my album real quick before I fucking forget to nah, do we'll that? No, we'll do that at the end. <laughs> I'm gonna forget. You ain't gonna forget nothing. All right. We're here. Uh, I want to tell you a story, though. I came with a story to tell you because I think you'll appreciate this story. So when I was in college, I, I went on a I went on a run of like 0 for 21 trying to get jobs. And I was a hustler. I've been on my own the whole time. I've always worked. I've always had multiple jobs. Were these resume jobs or like a job at no, Burger King? A little bit of both. Okay. It was a uh, record and tape trader, you know, anywhere I could, anywhere I could try to get some. Some were resume and uh, end up going uh downtown baltimore i go to this it's it's like an employment office and i am the white guy in the room of like 150 people i'm the white guy and it's for ups okay shout out to ups baltimore hub primary one joe avenue and i end up getting hired as a christmas helper a seasonal helper to call them drivers helpers right and they said, look, the, the guy that runs this route that's been doing this for years is hurt. His back's fucked up. So we got this younger kid in his 30s on the gig. I was in college. I'm 21, 2. Um, and they're like, uh, he's got to do his next day air packages, meaning he's going to take that package truck. He's going to deliver all the ones that are priority by 10 a.m. At 10 a.m., he's going to pull up on your street. He's going to beep the horn, and you're going to walk out of your house you're going to get in the passenger side of that truck, and you guys are going to start delivering packages all through Baltimore County in this area. And you're hustling. The deal is he does the packages on his side of the truck. I do them on my side of the truck. Now, this is before Amazon, all that shit. So we're hustling. It's nonstop. They're letting you work overtime. till We, we go 10 a.m. till 9 at night, go back to the hub. So it's one day. They're, they're, pro, uh, they're, they're fucking, um, uh, what is it? The rules for package delivery is out of sight, out of, in the city, you have to get a signature. You leave that shit on the steps in Baltimore city that 10 people come running for that fucking thing. But in the County out of sight, out of weather, a lot of people had a deck, you could put it under there or whatever. You let them know where it was. So this delivery on my side here and I, I get this package and I go up and I rap on the door and I can hear people in the house and nothing. So I go around the back and I rap on the door back there. I can totally hear him in the house. Shit's going on. I go back around again. You know, we're hustling. So the driver's like, what's going on? I'm like, I don't know, man. I can hear people in here. They're just not answering. So I, again, I'm ringing the bell, I'm knocking on the front door, nothing. I go back around the back again to leave the package under the deck. And while I'm back there, just for the hell of it, I bang one more time. Nothing. We go on about our day. We get back to the hub nine o'clock at night, and the supervisor comes up and he's like, "How about that crazy guy on your route today?" Now, look, we're in Baltimore. Like, there's a shitload of crazy people all fucking day. <laughs> we're seeing. We're we're going through the same neighborhoods all day. We see these people. So, uh, oh yeah, there's crazy people on the route all day. He goes, "No, man, the murder." And we're like, "What?" He's like, "The murder." I'm like, "Both of us, are, we don't know what you're talking about." And he's like, "This address right here, where you delivered." That guy killed two people, and he was burying them in the basement while I was there. <laughs> this motherfucker. I just looked it up again the other day. I'll send you the link. I thought it was about seven or eight hundred dollars. This dude, it was somewhere. It was under three hundred bucks. This guy owed these two two. What this this ain't even dealers. These are fucking friends that borrow money. And he had a house in Arbutus. And he, it's where we were. And there's two cars on the yard. You could have sold those to a salvage yard, got this money for it. You know what I mean? They'd have come out and towed it for you. You could have paid these guys off. But he goes out to where I grew up, Carroll County, and meets these two dudes. And 
instead of giving them the money, he kills these motherfuckers right there, puts them in his car, drives them back to his house, and then starts to bury them in the basement. Now, what he didn't know is one of those dudes had just had a newborn with his girlfriend. So his girlfriend calls the police after he's been gone for hours. She hadn't heard from anybody. And there's no cell phones or anything. And the police, she says, they went to this Patapsco State Park to meet this dude. His name is this. He lives here. Like, so my baby's in this car. So they go, and the baby's fine. Baby's there. But she gives them everything they need. They go to this dude's house. This motherfucker killed these two dudes. And he's digging up his basement to try to bury him in the basement, but he busts the water a lot, a pipe or something, and, and the bodies can't be buried. They're just floating there. So when they show up, they're just there, these two fucking bodies, and they take the dude away. And I'm out there beating on the fucking door, trying to deliver a fucking UPS bag. He's like, I got your line, man. That was fucking insane. He probably never got your package. In, hell no. He never got that pack. It was under the deck. He might have, but the cops <laughs> got his ass, and now he's gone. I just looked it up the other day. It's a link on the Baltimore Sun. I was like, what the fuck? It's amazing what you would have to do. Right. And how you're going to get caught anyway, because... To kill let's two. Let's say you pick up the bodies and put them in your trunk of your car. Blood everywhere. Blood Already. everywhere, DNA. So that means you got to light that car on fire. That's right. At the end of the fucking job. So now you got to take them somewhere, wrap them, <laughs> dig a hole, throw lime on them to help the body decompose and hope that fucking Johnny Jaga doesn't come by. You know how fucking heavy a body is? Imagine when it's dead and you got to drag it. I mean, I've carried a couple of buddies that drank too much. Yeah. Dead and weight, the, and, and they, they are, the it failed like heavy. 500 pounds. Yeah. Well, I love in movies when they show a guy just digging up a body. That guy, is a, that's an all night job. Sounds like you. you yeah, I was gonna go, say you gotta go three or four scary. feet. I was gonna say you keep saying this you with like so much knowledge, feet, lime. You gotta go three or four feet, and you gotta cover it uh, good, and you gotta hold, and then you gotta. That's you, hours. It take you that's by hours. yourself with that's a regular it's shovel. Hours. It's hours. Hours. That's why you have to have. The I've hole. dug in ground pools, and it's taken days. That's why you have to have the the hole dug already. By the time you kill the people, if you're gonna go make the drug deal. So you can just throw them in the fucking Two hundred dollars, Joey Diaz. Yeah, but I know. Listen, there's people that'll kill you over thirty five. You know what? You're right about that. There's people that'll kill you over twenty. Yeah, you're right. You know, me, it'd have to be two guys carrying twenty two kilos of blow. You know, and then you got to chop it up. You got somebody's got to help you with that job. So that means you got two people who know your secret. That's right. So now I got to kill you and put you <laughs> in the hole while you're, you're digging. Right I got to shoot you and take the money. <laughs> Because now I gotta live the rest of my life knowing that. That's the truth. You know this. Twenty yep. years from now, I'm in my backyard. They knock the door down. Lee got popped with heroin, and up in Manhattan, this is the gem he gave him. That we bet he takes him right to the body, and they find my fucking t-shirt on the grave in the sweat. There you go. That's how quick you go away now. That's how quick you go away. That's very vivid. Hey, I've thought about it a lot. <laughs> Clearly, you thought about that shit. And then you got to take your car and burn it. So now, six weeks later, the cops are going to come to you. You're already an alleged suspect. They already came and spoke to you. You told me you haven't seen nobody. And now they're going to come back to you and say, Mysterious, we found your car on fire because you can't hide that. I'm pretty sure this guy wasn't, didn't have a plan. Yeah, no. He, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He, he did not have a plan. Well, a man without a plan is not a man. That's Nietzsche right. said that. So. But that's it's that's why it kills me when people get caught for murder, because I know for over twenty years, people not in my neighborhood but in those five boroughs in New York were killing people on a daily and making the bodies disappear. How? No body, no murder. <clears throat> if you want to send a message, then you leave the body on the street. But if you want the body to disappear, hey, Ryan Sickle was here. We did the podcast. Listen to it. <laughs> they come back, no body, no nothing. I have to have that pre-planned. I have to have tape in the car. Tape in the car. <laughs> I got to bury you with a fucking cap on because I'm not, I got to shave my head before I kill you and my body hair. You have thought a lot about this. You have to. Uh, you have do to. you? No, you don't. <laughs> was, you might when, have to. When I was going through my shit, Years ago, this is <coughs> this is what you know. This is what I learned, and this is what. <laughs> Who do you learn it from? The guy in Denver, in Colorado, oh, Colorado. Yeah. in prison or out of prison? out of prison? Way before prison, way before three or prison. four years before prison. 
And then you just learn from watching guys and reading how many murders the mob got done with that you'll never see the people. They just got rid of the bodies. But people get in trouble for murder every day. If you cover every trace, there's a lot of steps. I was going to say, these days an I, eyelash will they, get you. An eyelash, a fucking clone with a camera. I, you know what? You're right just, about you're that. Done. They'll fly them these days. They, 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 listen, you as know? far as I'm concerned, you know, it's funny. When I grew up, I grew up around these old-time Cubans that would not even have a conversation if a phone was in the room. Like, if there was a phone on the desk, they'd go outside and talk. They were already hip to the NFL, the microphones. The feds could, in the 80s and 70s would bounce that off the glass. So even if you were standing in front of a bodega, the feds could point at you with those guns and get the vibrations of what you're saying off the glass. They were uh, hip to that. They wouldn't even talk around glass. Wow. They would talk in the middle of the street on concrete, very hard, <laughs> very hard to tape unless you know they're going to have a conversation at that. Right. Uh, you fly a drone the, over here. Whatever, but there was no drone. None, none back then. Now yeah. there's not much you could do. Look at this. I said it for years. Look, then somebody just got arrested for Alexa. You want to buy Alexa and talk shit in front of her? You're going to jail. I heard uh, they saw, help jail. solve a they murder or something, something, right? Yeah, I heard I don't that. want Alexa close to my fucking house. Yeah. <laughs> These phones are the kiss of death. Yeah. They tape everything. They do. These phones, they tape everything. Dude, I, I, shit I will talk about will pop up in my feed. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it happens all the time. They're recording this, everything. This is recording everything. Absolutely. When you're jerking off in front of the camera, in front of you porn, and you're going back and forth looking Chinese, your eyes are rolling. <laughs> there's video they got that on tape, Yeah, there's video The sad part is it's probably in those terms of like service that we all agree to because who, who's going to read it at when, any day we can make we, a montage of you and put it out on youtube i think i for years i've always said when you go to the bathroom on a plane that mirror they're watching you that's too much an investment for them not to be watching you keep a little camera behind there and keep an something, eye on whatever the fuck you're doing back there. way before 9 11 in my paranoid cocaine mind i always was even scared to do bumps in the bathroom I would sit down and make believe I was taking a shit and then bend my head down <laughs> and do two bumps of coke. And, and, I, and, I, and I wipe my ass and everything. Like if I didn't, I'd get right. up and show my dick. Never got mirror. caught? Never got caught. Never got caught. I have an aunt that uh, she was on to, you know, we used to think she was crazy and now I think she was right. <laughs> but she had, uh, back in the phone, uh, home phone days, she would hear her phone click and uh, gone. New number. Right away, new fucking number. And we would always be like, you're fucking crazy. And now I see that they admit they've been listening and everything else. I'm like, you you fucking, you were on to it early on. In the 80s. She'd be like, why don't you call me? Were, I'm like, because I don't have your new fucking nut. You changed 10 numbers this year. I knew when I was a kid, I read something once that different words activated different computers. Oh. Bomb, cocaine, the word eight ball. Different things. Like you know. program it into this, and then when program, it hears it, it'll start it picking. That's it, it when it starts, starts recording. It, it starts picking it oh, up. Oh, shit. I know in the 80s and 70s, I know this for a fact, that if I tapped Ryan Sickler's phone, I would have to, by law, go to the phone box because there was not just a cable box. Oh, an old there. school gray box? Box. Okay. And if you opened that box and looked on your tag... There would have to be a tag on it that said FBI, County Sheriff's Office, Prosecutor's Office. So, so legally, they have to identify, identify. it, but ninety nine percent of people never go look at that box and not even know what's on there in box. the first place. Never go I, look see. At I had a red box in eighty seven. What's a red box? Cop got me a red box in eighty seven. It's something that you plug into your phone, and if the light turns red, they'll tell you if your phone is tapped. Re did it ever? Yes. Did it? Yes. Towards the end of Boulder, the home phone, Aspen. you like plug it in. Yes. And they're tapping you for what do you think? Do you know at that time? At that time, it was drugs. Right. I was involved in the drug ring. And, and they're just listening to see if they can gather caught. as many people as they yeah. can and put them all together. Yeah. Damn. <clears throat> you should never say, I was raised not to say anything on the phone. And it was funny because my stepfather was anti-phone. And he would yell at my mother all the time. Don't fucking say shit on the phone. Don't talk about numbers. Don't talk about anything. And my eighth grade year... My mother still had the bar, but she had two phones. 
she had a payphone that rang behind the bar. And then she had a private phone in her office. So if you called the bar phone, she could pick up the phone behind the bar, but the phone in the phone booth would ring. One day, somebody made a drug deal on that phone, and they came and arrested my mother. They did. Because the phone was in her name. She didn't go to prison. Right, she but she's an attorney. Right. Blah, blah, blah. It she still made, made her life judge. hell. It made her life hell. Yeah. <clears throat> it was one of the things that started the beef within her and my stepfather that they split up because he told her for years. Don't say she don't have to. That's every fucking that mafia fucking movie phone. you've ever seen. Don't talk don't on the phone. Don't say a fucking word. Keep it light. Everything was code. Even if you could avoid code. You know, all you got to say is recycler, meet me at the coffee shop. Number three, have three or different four coffee shops. So you know what number one is, what number two is. Number one is the Starbucks on Lancashire. Number two is the Starbucks on Laurel Canyon. And like that, they can't catch it. After a while, they're going to catch on, but by that time, you're going to switch on them again. Number two is now Laurel Canyon. They are listening. I love the criminal mind, man. I mean, some of those people are so masterful. If they were to put it toward anything, they would be fucked. I respect cancer. it. I do, too. I, I love respect it. it. I, I love there, it. There's parts of me. It's a way of thinking. That I respect it because I respect a guy like Sammy the Bull Gravano, for example. Never mind he was a rat. Let's pretend we don't know nothing. Sammy the Bull was dyslexic and quit school in the eighth grade. And when he went to jail, one of his many businesses, let's say his worst racket, he was making 15000 a week on loan chart. Damn. He was making 60000 a month. Jesus um, Christ. That, that doesn't just even loan include, right. Just loan yes. sharking, 20000 to Lee, 50000 to Ryan Sickler to shoot his video, but you're going to give me seventy five on that fifty. you You're going to pay me every fucking week on time with tax on to the principal. And people do it. It's a way of life for people. It's a school loan. Yeah, it's it is a school, school loan. loan. You're yeah. right. It's a school loan. And, but at that time, just the deadly that, potentially deadly interest. Just on that alone, like a guy like that, when Gotti let him loose, you know, it's well known. If you read anything about Samuel Bugavano, he owned a company that did everything in the construction trade marble floors, Italian floors, cabinets. So they could do the whole thing. So he would bid and he would win the bids. And people going to John Gotti going, Doug, we can't get work. Sammy has the city locked up that tight. He was in bed with Trump. He was way in bed with Trump. Everybody knows that. And he was just building buildings. You know what an ounce, you know what a square foot of concrete costs you in Iowa? Ten cents. You know what a square feet of concrete costs you in New York? Two dollars and ten cents. Jesus. That's damn. the mafia tax. Yeah. <clears throat> the mafia tax is making three million a month just off concrete. Every time the mafia would see concrete getting poured, they beeped the horn. <laughs> <laughs> we're making money today. It's crazy when you see that type of, when you see a guy that makes zero to 60 and you can't fucking put it together. You can't put it together in your life, but these guys' minds are completely different. I have a chapter in the book dedicated to the guy's mind that twisted. I gave him his own chapter because he was four steps in front of you. It was something that I had never seen before. Like in what way? Like would you go to him for advice or would he just always be telling you like here's how it goes or like how I did watched that go? him. I watched him. I watched him and I studied him. You know, in the beginning of fell on black days. One of the lyrics is, whatsoever I feared has come to life, you know? Mm -hmm. And there's times I find myself being him, even though I hated him. Because of... Being his, him in the way he was, meaning you're four steps ahead of what these people were thinking? He was already... He had money. If you looked at him, he wouldn't give you the impression that all oh, you look at him and go, now, that guy's a bum. He played you to the last minute. 
he always kept you guessing. I loved that element of life. And then he would fuck with people without them knowing he was fucking with them. <laughs> That's another element of life. Yeah. Like, I'll put on a sweatshirt backwards. That drives people crazy. Which it shouldn't. It shouldn't. Right, affect shouldn't you. Yeah, it shouldn't at all. You know how many people <laughs> come up to me and go, you know your sweatshirt's on backwards? It drives them crazy. <laughs> you know, for years I had pants that I would purposely put a hole by my dick <laughs> so my nutsack could pop out. So you have to Wait, see my nutsack. You put that in yourself? I did it myself. I would have got a little hole and rip it open a little more. I have one one time where my balls so stuck out. Just so you would have to see, have to see my nutsack. Yeah, and then when you come to me and say, there's a hole in your nutsack, I go, can I ask you a question? Why were you looking? <laughs> and it cracks people. Yeah. You can hear them. The psychological. Why are you trying to crack people? Because you're too stupid. Think about what's in front of you. Don't be looking at my balls. <laughs> the fuck are you looking at my balls for? Look ahead. Straight ahead. And cut, shut your mouth and pay I attention. I love that criminal mind. He. Man. I do. I, I, he was my stepfather. And I'll never forget they caught me with a knife. One time they, they, like, I was so out of control before I went to Catholic school that they would have to do drop buys on me. So they would drop me off at my godmother's house, and I would never know when they were coming. So they, my godmother would tell me in the morning, they're going to be here at 5. And next thing you know, I was running down the street with a pocket full of cash, and I'd see my mother, and I'd be dirty, and she'd go, come here. And he would tell me, turn around. They'd search me, and I'd have a knife. I'd have $22 on me. They'd go, where'd you get this from? You're in the third grade. <clears throat> so then my mom put a ban on anybody giving me money. Like anybody who came to the bar, like, oh, you would hustle those guys? Or they yeah, just, they you were the to, kids. Like, yeah, well, I was a kid, I'd go to the bar yeah, and i tell them yeah. jokes and shit. You know, they drive yeah. crazy. I'd be one of those guys. And they'd give me a five, five to get rid yeah, of me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah five dollars. <laughs> we'll buy some candy. I'm over here trying to suck this six pussy, and you want to tell me about Batman? Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> so I'd go to the bar and work it for like twenty, thirty dollars When you're fucking eight in 1970, $40 is like a $100 bill. Yeah. So I would go up to Harlem and buy weapons. Weapons? What kind of weapons? You stars. Throwing no stars. stars shit, throwing yeah. stars. Yeah. We would take the A train to Chinatown and fucking, they would sell you the stars that weren't sharpened. So you go back home and throw them against the tree and they wouldn't stick. Then you had to go to a local hardware store. And Harry, the fucking guy, wouldn't want to do it. I'm not responsible. You didn't think yeah. Come on, Harry. Oh, that's Harry. all sparking. Like, I'm not responsible. So Harry would he say. He would? He'd this, sharpen them for you? Oh, my God. This guy, will, he would say, oh I won't God. do it. I won't do it. I won't There's do it. There's always a guy, man. And after a week, we'd break his window, and then he would do it. Oh, my God. <laughs> week. We'd break his fucking window, and then a week later, I'll sharpen it, you fucks. You know, these kids were way ahead of the fucking curve. Oh, yeah, man. <clears throat> so my stepfather searched him one day and found the 007. All right, but wait, why is he? Is he? Is this a daily thing, or you just were it in became, trouble a lot? So now he's thing. all right. So now he's checking it you because you've been a hell. I look at my daughter the other day, and I'm bouncing her on my lap. And I'm like, she's going to be in the first grade. And I, I still remember vividly in the first grade, I was stealing the teacher's editions of books <laughs> yeah. with the answers yeah. and selling them to kids. Selling them? You even, were, even you the were teachers keeping it for yourself? Book. No, I was even selling them to the kids like for a dollar, 50 cents, a can of soda, <laughs> a hot dog. I'll never forget the teacher going, where's all my teacher's edition book? <laughs> like I would rob every single teacher's edition, including hers with the notes and everything. How much were you selling for? Whatever, 50 cents. As long as I could buy like a record a album. Candy like a record, bar, like this soda, bar. Yeah. yeah. I was already into that trouble. They used to have this thing called <laughs> SRA. Standard reading assessment, and you went up in colors. But the last thing was the answers. Not one of them had answers. I had all the answers to SRA. So the only way you can move up is by first seeing grade. Do you six first, right second now. grade, third grade? <laughs> I was already hustling. Like I already knew the word of hustle. Where would you keep this stuff? Like you had a locker. I would have money under my in the closet in the shoe. You know, I would hide different things, and then. <laughs> I didn't start stealing. I never stole from my mother, but I'd steal from one. At an early age, when he married my mother and he moved in, he would always leave money on top of the counter, and I would look, and I would take a twenty, and he would fucking catch me every time. He would take like a hair out and put it on top. Oh, you know, yeah. He would flip the rubber band twice. He would put tape on the door, and I would never see it. And That's my old and, one. Tape on the door. The tape yeah. on the door. That's an old detective. All trick. type shit. Yeah. You know? Were you in the room? No. 
how can you not be in the room? The tape was broken. And, you know, he always busted me. I'm like, this motherfucker. So he started shaking me down. <laughs> so before I left the house, I would have to shake down. So what I would do. Oh, they pat you down on the way out on and the on the way out. in? Oh, yeah. When I lived in New York City, <laughs> You're getting the double, dude. I would have to lift my hands up and they would pat me down on the way out and on the way in. So if I had a weapon, I would have to throw yeah. out the window. Yeah. I would have to call my friend on the eighth floor and go, go outside. I'm going to throw you the fucking BB gun outside the window. <laughs> Bro, I had a BB gun when I was like in the third grade. It was called the Marksman Repeater. Dig up a Marksman Repeater. A Marksman Repeater was brilliant. They cost 10 bucks and they delivered them to your house. Your mom never even knew it. Oh they brought God. it to your house? Yeah, they asked you a question. Were you 21 or 48? <laughs> yeah. you know, look up a Marksman Repeater. Oh, my God. Look at the size of these things. I had a Daisy 880. Wait it was a pellet and wait, BB. Remember wait those? Wait you Pump see it. this Marksman Repeater. In the eighth and grade. so who would bring it to your house? The store would the deliver? mailman. You would go on a fucking website. Oh, you'd you order would, it. Okay. You would go on. It wasn't an in town. Look guy. at the Marksman Repeater. It's the second one. Look at what this that thing, thing? looks. Oh yeah. That oh was yeah. Real, man. That's had, one of those metal ones. I've had one of those. I had yeah. one of those in the third grade. But yeah. the specialty about the Marksman Repeater was the third one. Oh, the one? third one. And doesn't the front right here flip up like? Yes, this? and yeah. that shot darts. I've had that. Yeah. It shot darts, yeah. pellets, and BBs. Yeah. So I was a three-way fucking killer. I could shoot you with a dart. I could shoot you with a pellet. You know how many fucking people I shot with pellets for no reason? Just fucking shot them on 148th Street, like from my window. Because I was a geek. I used to build fucking models. So the, the model was the first thing I do to. But I've been thinking about a Marksman repeater for a week now. You know how much damage I caused, I caused with that fucking thing? When my parents caught me with that, my mom snapped. Like she just snapped. She was broken hearted. So they put me in a Catholic boarding school. Because of this right here? That was it. That and the knife just killed my mother. And she was like, that's it. I'm putting you with the nuns to fucking straight. <laughs> See, my, my dad was good about it. My dad gave us a buck knife. My dad gave us the BB gun. Like, I know, but you were you were in a lot of fucking trouble already. Plus, that wasn't until middle school, and you were in first fucking grade. Third grade. I Third grade. I was shooting grade. repeater. I would wait all day. The box would get delivered to your house. And you could buy pellets anywhere. Yeah. And I would fill my Remember, pockets. you get like a milk carton of them. Yeah. Remember? yeah. I would, a milk carton. That's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. I would fill my pockets with the pellets. Because the BBs, you could put like 30 BBs yeah. in there. So it was like a machine gun. I could shoot Lee <laughs> yeah, yeah. from the time he left here all the way to the time he got to his car. Just <laughs> belt them with BBs all over the place. Yeah. The pellets, you had one to load at one at a time. That's right. And the darts, you had to load one at a time. Wait, it shot darts? Yeah, darts, shot all three. Darts. darts, pellets, and BBs. And BBs. It's amazing you didn't kill anybody as nah, a child. I shot a couple you had, people in the leg. <laughs> no, yeah, but you had yeah. like the the throwing stars that were actually sharpened. We used to play BB tag. We would do this thing where we'd have uh, our Daisy 880 rifle, and we, we'd tie a cookie sheet to the front and back. You put the holes in the cookie sheet, tie a rope, and just lay it over like shoulder pads. You'd have a cookie sheet on the front and back, and we'd all run around with goggles on. And the agreement was one pump because on one pump you could see that you could see it coming, you know what I mean? It wouldn't hit you that hard, but then you know everybody always cover them pop right in the leg all the time. Get one in the leg. My buddy got one. It's still he still got a scar from it being buried up under his leg. It's crazy. What BB we used tag. To do each Stupid other. shit. Fucking BB tag. BB tag. I still remember playing hot peas and butter. What's that? Go get your mother. So we was we would be in that yard outside. In front here, it's fenced. And when you say yard, this is a concrete yard. This is a concrete yeah, yard. It had to be 100 yards long on 88th Street. 205 right next to it. There was a, 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 a parking garage that mm -hmm. wasn't being used. So that whole space became our playground. Hot peas and butter. Go get your mother as everybody turns around against the wall. And I get a belt and I hide it. All right. And then we all have to go looking for the belt. The designated... There's a home base. You're not allowed to use the buckle. You can only whip with the belt. So, <laughs> at least you have rules. So I'm sitting there, and you guys are looking for it. And whoever's close to it, I gotta go. You're hot, Lee. You're cold. You're cold. Ryan, you're hot. Ryan's hot. Ryan's hot. Ryan. Well, as soon as I say Ryan's hot, Lee and the other kid attack Ryan because they know it's in that area. Right. But everybody's scared because somebody's gonna get that belt at any minute. But you've been whipped all day, so you, you're sick and tired of getting whipped. You're going to get it, Lee, and next thing you know, 
in a brick. You move the brick, there's the buckle. And you take it out, and those two guys are behind you, and the base is over there. You got to run past them with the base. So now they whip you with the belt <laughs> all the way to the base. <laughs> that game would always end with somebody getting whipped to the head. And buckle to the oh head. Oh, my God, yeah, a buckle right, to yeah. the head. This is like a Passover when Jews find the Afi Koma and said, we don't hit each other with a belt. We get a quarter after. Oh my, what are you and talking about? For hot peas and butter, go get your mother. And yeah, because you your nose out, is broken. Get the belt, then you whipped each other to death with the belt. And then we got into, if you look, not in today's modern chairs, but in the old chairs before the roller, it was a flat piece of metal that had a cork in it with a nail, a screw that went up, and that's how your chairs, your chairs, and you can move them there. back and forth. You couldn't wheel them. We would fucking take that, uh, we'd take a chair, turn it over. This is the second grade. <laughs> My grammar school, every chair was fucking Oh, you're, you're not do you're doing this in the school, it's not at people's grade. houses. No, 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 second grade. <laughs> While the teacher would give us an assignment, we'd take a chair, take the, unscrew the bottom piece of it, and then you'd take it to the hardware store, and he would click the screw out with the gut of the Same thing, guy doing the throwing star? Which would give you a flying saucer. Okay. It would give you a flying saucer that was made of metal. And then you would take a crayon and melt the crayon <laughs> into the saucer so that was your piece of metal. So you were blue. You had a red one. You had a purple one. Second grade. Second grade. And then in the middle of the street, it would be like the man would be like shooting pool. Number one, number two. Then you got to hit it over. Like number bocce three. ball, trying to hit them out of the oh, way you and hit shit it with your too. thumb. Okay. You got to hit so it with your thumb. So you're flicking it. And then we'll go to number four, and then you have to get to number eight. But we're playing this one. Cars are going by. <laughs> yeah. Like a car would stop, and we go, fuck you. Hold on one second. We were like fucking in the second grade, dog, in New York City. Those, those people hated us. I wonder, oh my God. <laughs> no wonder why. It sounds like, like how, you, how you like in prison will get like a knife together. You were, how, what, how, how do you even think, you know what, I bet we could take the bottom of this chair and we Mr. Would whatever it. would melt it down and I'll sell it. I'll never forget in August in New York. <sighs> every August, they would shut the streets down and they would replant all the trees. It was called the street rejuvenation. Mm -hmm. And for, 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 from 8 to 12, they would shut the street, and they would replant every tree. But the top three inches was this uh, generic dirt that had already been bushed together, and with rain, the dirt would melt into each other, and it would cause a topsoil. <clears throat> we caught that shit before it even started raining. So as soon as those construction guys would leave, four guys would go across the street, we would go across the street, and we'd play bomb with those things. <laughs> And when you hit with somebody with those, it just blows up and smoke comes out and dust. So you're dirty as fuck. Oh, we would throw shit. those at each other for fucking hours. And then we would go to a street like if 87 didn't have kids on it, let's go to 87 Street. There's no kids. And their trees would have that shit. And we'd play for two hours there. Just throwing dirt each at other. one another. I still remember being a kid on 88th Street. And one night me and like six little gorillas are hanging out like in the second grade. And one kid goes, is that a rat? And this rat had to be a foot long. And we chased that motherfucker, hit it with a stick. We hit it with a stick till he, he was making noises. We're hitting him with sticks. Then we threw rocks at him. Then we threw more. Then we fucking hit him with a two by four. He was dead. We must have beat him when he was dead for an hour. I still remember, And then we got a, we figured out a way how to drag him out into the middle of the street and light him on fire. <laughs> God, so I'm like, riding over his head. I mean, you know, killing a rat when it's you're a, a rat. kid yeah. is fucking, that's New York City shit. Like, that was how New York City, and that was on 88th Street. That was the calm kids I hung out with. Once I got into Santa Ria, I started hanging out on 48th <laughs> Street. Christ. And that's why I bought the knife. That's why I got the marks from repeated, uh, delivered to my godmother's house, because she wouldn't ask questions. <laughs> She just said, it's you just package for you. you know, yeah, what eight year old isn't getting packaged? Right. Yeah, right. At that time, I was hustling Columbia House. Yeah, I remember. It was a record company named Columbia House. Yeah. So I was hustling them. So it was I was like uh, 20 cassettes for a penny or some shit like that. Eight cassettes for they, a penny. They had that with CDs when I was going And on then the next three were That's at right. $21.99. That's and right. you had to buy four albums in a year to cancel your subscription. Fuck you. 
I would put that penny on a postcard because remember you had to put a penny. Yep. You had a fucking Scotch tape a penny on a postcard. And your little stamps for the albums and you your wanted. stamp for the albums and send it. So I would keep sending it to the same address, only under different names. <clears throat> so my godmother wouldn't know what the fuck was going on. Every time I go to my godmother, she kept, you keep getting these bills up here. Who's Carlos Torres? Don't worry about it. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> and then I started doing it all. I started doing it. Anybody's house I went to, I would take their address down. And I would talk to my mother. My mother would go, you got a box over at Guillermo's house. And I'd go, really? That's it. And I'd go over to Guillermo's house, and for a year, he got bills from me. And he would come to the bar. Why am I getting bills at my house from Columbia House? I scanned for Columbia House for like every album. They had Christmas albums, Hell yeah. black albums, Spanish albums. We had a teacher that told us, if you're, he told us in high school, and we were, we were sophomores, he gamed it straight up. He's like, I'll be honest with you. If you're under 18, you don't have to pay for shit. And he told all of us, he encouraged us, go get all those CDs you want. And then when they send you a bill, he said, take out a crayon and write, I'm 16 and send that shit back. You'll never hear from him ever again. So we would do the same thing, but we wouldn't do it that much. We would send it to the, a, a buddy over here or down the street. Oh, I ordered yeah. everything on, on, yeah, on everything. magazines. I ordered the thing. I wanted a little trophy. When I first came from Cuba, what? I couldn't wait to get a trophy. <laughs> you just, a, so, just a trophy? I just wanted a trophy. <laughs> Sometimes you just want a trophy. <laughs> Sometimes you want a Kit Kat. I just want a trophy. trophy. What kind of trophy do you want? So I just wanted a trophy. <laughs> Anything. So Joe Weeder had this thing. The muscle I remember guy, Joe Weeder, yeah. There was yeah. a guy at the beach, a chick with a skinny guy at the beach, and the muscle guy comes over and kicks sand in his face. It was like a cartoon. And then you <laughs> sent a dollar ninety nine to Joe Weeder, and he sent you back training tips and a trophy that you were a weightlifter. And you would have to do the push-ups, and then you came back a week later and beat the guy up for taking your chick when you had muscles. <laughs> what a marketing scam! Oh, I see. All and right, I'm yeah. going, Jesus Christ, this is hilarious. Like I had little trophies from Joe Weida. I ordered, that's when you had to order whoopee cushions, right? X-ray glasses. <laughs> so they'd show you X-ray glasses. There'd be a girl in a bikini, and you with X-ray glasses on like this. With your mouth open, those X-ray glasses didn't fucking no. work. You got beat, Jack. Right, you did. You'd be like, and then they had Spanish Fly. And I remember that the first time me and my buddies bought Spanish Fly, we're like, <laughs> who were we going to give it to? And we gave it to one of my friend's grandmother. We all went over there and watched fucking Donnie and Marie. And we just stared at the grandmother for like two hours to see if she would scratch her pussy. Anything. Give us a sign that you're only grandma. Grandma didn't do shit, so we never Because if this. she was, you we, guys were ready? Oh, yeah, we were like in the eighth grade. <laughs> I'll never forget the kid giving up his mother. He's like, fuck it, let's use it on my mother. <laughs> I don't want to say his name because people hate him. But I still remember going to his house, watching the Donnie and Marie for family Gave hour. His grandma, Like man. four of us just sitting there going, is she scratching the pussy yet? Like... Is she fingering herself? Like, we're all waiting for Like, she's just going to do that in yeah. the living room. <laughs> like, you're such a fucking idiot when you're a kid. Yeah, you are. Right. Spanish you flies and make a woman go crazy. Oh, and that was the yeah. ad. Like, the ad was a girl in a bar, and then a girl passed out like Cosby's, and you're fucking her. That was the lead. That was the ad in the late 60s, 70s. You meeting a girl at a bar, like, with a martini glass, and the next minute you're both in bed, like, giggling, like, making love. That was the ad for Spanish fly. So it guaranteed women would get loose. Yeah, but then you're not supposed to give it to the grandma. But that was our... We you're wanted, a kid. They before didn't know. We gave, before we gave it to girls in the seventh grade. She was grade, a tester. <laughs> before we gave it to girls in the seventh grade. Seventh grade. Like eighth grade. Yeah. We wanted to test it. Like we got in the mail on a Friday and we couldn't wait. We couldn't fucking wait to test on somebody. <laughs> so this kid volunteered his grandma. Give it to grandma. <laughs> grandma. She's going to be over there. My mom's going to be out playing cards. If she dies, who gives a fuck? And we gave, <laughs> like, we, we, I never forget, he gave grandma like two capsules. And we put them in like what, her tea like or milk something? Or something. Yeah. <laughs> grandma, you want some warm milk? Bless your heart. We're sitting there all night fucking howling, waiting for grandma to start finger banging herself. That oh night, the, we left there depressed as fuck. Was grandpa still alive? We lost our investment. <laughs> we were a bunch of perverted oh, kids. Then there was a time shit. you could order pornos. You could order pornos, and it came with a fucking projector. It came with equipment. Super eight projector. So it was a super eight projector, and a and a point and two homemade pornos, and you had to send the money order. So you had to walk up to the fucking Chinese store or the post office, get a money <laughs> order. You couldn't go to your mother and get a check. 
In those days, it wasn't like now that they could deposit a check. You had to wait 22 days for a check to clear in the fucking 60s and 70s. It was a nightmare. So we had to get a money order. And I still remember waiting six weeks for the fucking camera to come. And it came in a box and you plugged it in. And it was very frail. And it just had two things. And it was Super 8. So it had two reels. And you connected this one to this one. You pressed play. And wow, until the and other, it would just go 10, back. 9, 8, 7, And six. it worked? Yeah, and it would go down to like, and all of a sudden, like a fucking chick that was beat up would come up, and she would start <laughs> sucking some guy's dick that was huge, and they were disgusting pornography. It wasn't nothing like what you see today. The chick didn't know she was being taped. You know, most of the times there were rapes that were being filmed. And these are being mailed to people? <clears throat> there, there was no legislation. Right, yeah. Nobody, nobody, nobody gave <laughs> yeah. a fuck. Was this like a porn magazine? Like that would have this, these like, ads? It would be like a cheap porn magazine. There was a Puerto Rican porn magazine called Pica Pica. It was, just, <laughs> it was with naked women with their faces covered. Why do I want to see that? Right. Like this guy was tricking chicks. Like he would take right. them home and take their pictures and, and put like black over their eyes. And, sh- and they would show you that pussy like they had that magazine. I forgot what magazine we got it from. But I remember it was like five of us that chipped in. And we all went up to my attic and we fucking put curtains on the wall, like a sheet, and we made sandwiches. Sandwich. And we thought we were about to see like this fucking, you know, like fucking Farrah Fawcett getting yeah. fucked. It was some chick with flat titties that had been shot. Shot. You know. <laughs> Some black guy with a big, big dick. The kid, I mean, one of the kids, you know, and I, in the bit, I said that one of the kids started crying. He was like 12. Like, we were like 14, <laughs> yeah. 13, and we're watching this big black dick fucking a white chick. Like, we never saw that before. Everybody went home. Like, we're like, turn it off, turn it off. It's all over. Like, nobody wanted to have sex no more. That's the, bad. The, that's how done. bad porn was. Yeah. Then. You could buy anything in the fucking mail. Anything. Right out of a fucking magazine. The best was getting magazines and sending them to people's houses. You mean for like just like the CD or the cassette? You so order I, them. I go to the dentist. I go to the dentist office. <laughs> you go to the magazine, People Magazine. That'd be a thing. Yeah. Fill it out. Send it in. We'll send you ten copies. I'd fill it out. Send it to Lisa Ayata. <laughs> for a year, any one time I went to an office, never something. I'd send them to Lee, and I'd wait for him to say one night, "I don't know what's going on. I keep getting these magazines sent to my house, and I would die of laughter." I would do that to people constantly. <laughs> if I wanted to fuck with you, I'd send you cabs. Like at 2 in the morning. Oh, and tell the cab driver yeah. to ring the doorbell. That my grand- and then they're expecting the fare and everything. That my grandma's deaf, please ring the doorbell. And then, oh, <laughs> no. And please. kids would come to school the next day. Somebody sent a cab to my kids, house. Kids, he's like, And me and my friends would be howling because it was us. Have you ever talked to, like, parents from the, your friends? Be like, what did you think of us as an 8-year-old? Like, yeah, like, how? What was it like having us as kids? Because they must have been like they can't have recovered yet. Like this is crazy. This is Who, crazy. Were you the worst in your group, or was there always one wor- that that would go an um uh you know an extra mile in your crew? Who was the guy that would just? Z- I feel like you're the guy, but I also feel like you no, know a guy. That, let's like, be you know, honest. Yeah. Let's be honest. This is what was going on because I thought about it a lot. I'm trying to write a book. There was only three or four Spanish kids when I moved to North Bergen in the neighborhood. We weren't the popular breed. We were the fucking Arab of today. You know what I'm saying? Like these people with their meet me the language and fucking <laughs> Telemundo and, you know, they didn't really know the culture, you know, Maracas and shit like that. So for me to get any attention as a kid, I had to be above and beyond them. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do, yeah. It's like when I tell people, if you want a good piece of pussy, fuck, fuck a white chick from Miami. Because she's been competing with Spanish girls all her life. <laughs> she's got to suck that dick better than them. You know what I'm saying? All yeah. the white kids are fucking the Spanish chicks because that pussy's good. You're a white chick in Miami. You hook up with a white chick from Miami, like Southwest, they will suck your dick till the pubic hairs fly out of your head. <laughs> because they've been trained. They have to. They know they're competing against hot Spanish chicks with Brazilian chicks and Puerto Rican chicks. You got to suck a good pipe. It's the same. <laughs> it's the same fucking thing with 
<laughs> with when I was growing up. So, like, it wasn't really an act to me. Like, I was fucking kind of out there as it was. My dad had died. You know, I was a little out there. My mom remarried. What age? Three. Three. But that fucked me up. Then my mom remarried. He... Do you remember anything? Anything? Or do you more remember pictures that you've seen? Or... No, no, I remember. There's a picture of my father in the living room. My sister sent me from Cuba via my cousins. It's my dad and my mom circa 1954 on a street corner in New York City with like three other couples. Like way before the Cuban Revolution. They were kids. They were kids. He was six foot four. I don't remember. Yeah, he's big. I remember being in a living in a kitchen in Union City when we first had the bar. I remember being a block away. We lived a block and a half away from the bar, and I remember that him and I would dip bread into olive oil. I love till today. Every time I see olive oil, I dip bread in. I think of my father. Isn't it crazy that connection with food and stuff like that? You have and smells. I, and I remember going through the Lincoln Tunnel with him sitting on his lap. At three, you remember that? At three, me That's driving good, his right. car. Like, I remember that. But I don't remember the tone of his voice right. or a conversation. I don't remember that like that. I, I recently, someone sent me a video of my grandmother. And, um, I mean, she was such a great woman. Took care of us. Like, she was a, a mom to us. And, uh, and I heard that video. And in my head, her voice was lower. It was weird. I, you know what I mean? Like the pitch was a little higher than I actually really remembered it. And I started realizing like, oh, you know, you, you start hearing that voice in your voice almost. Uh, but that was interesting to me because I was like, yeah, if you would have played that for me, I'm like, I don't think I would have guessed that was my grandmother at first. And then when the camera's on her, she starts talking. I was like, wow, I don't remember it being sounding exactly like that. If that makes any sense. I have two connections left in my mother's world. My godmother's daughter in Miami and my mother's brother in Glendale. And when I talk to my mother's brother, my uncle, and we've had a rocky 55-year relationship, him and I, but I spoke to him over the weekend, and it's weird. When I hang up with him, it's like talking to my mom only if she was a man. They have something in their voices that yeah. are very similar. You know, they like I could call my uncle on the way back from the comedy store. I know he's awake. Midnight is when he comes to life, Jack. He starts watching old baseball games. <laughs> he puts on Spanish music. I'll play his answer machine. It's hilarious. It's him. How old is he? 80. Is he really? He's 80. He walks five miles a day, Monday through Friday. He has had cancer for 10 years, and he switched his diet. He refuses to get chemo. So he has a no sugar diet. You got to see this guy's body. You know, at eighty, it's good. He huh? It's the bag an hour a day. Wow, it's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. And he runs a nightclub on Fridays and Saturdays. At eighty, damn, he still got it. Listen, when you go to Cleveland hilarities, take a look at Nick. Take a look at Nick Costas. At seventy five, you look at Nick Costas and you go, "Wow!" When I was growing up. A 75-year-old man was frail and small. Hunched over in a cane and a walker. Take a yeah. look at Nick at 75. You know why? Because he lifts weights five days a week in his basement. He does 35 minutes. He does calisthenics. He eats chicken. He stays away from red meat. He drinks a little bit of rope wine. His wife is sick. He's in, you look at Nick and you go, go ahead, touch his shoulder. You know when you tap people on the shoulder? Solid. It's like hitting a fucking rock. It makes you think. It makes you really fucking think, you know. Uh, we're going, you, how old are you now? 45. You're not a youngster. No, no hell you no. Know, I tell Lee all the time, you know, I wish I knew now, then what I know now about going on the road and eating healthy. When you go on the road at first, you're broke. Oh, you're chicken you're, fingers, yeah, fries, whatever, they eat give whatever you. the fuck they give you. It's you pizza. Eat, you know, but you do have a choice. You do. You do have a choice to eat the vegetables and the salads, salads. and whatever, but you, you think of the mozzarella sticks are this bad, the, the salad's got to <laughs> yeah, be brown. That's right. That's right. You know, I'll, if I'll eat it if tomatoes, it's fried. Yes. <laughs> but I think of all the, I, I, th I look at these guys now that are a little older, and you have to take care of yourself to go out on the road, and you know you can't go on the road and drink fucking three nights in a row no, no more. No you way. die. I'll die. You will die. I'll die. I'll yeah. die. I, gotta, I don't drink much at all anymore. Really? No. By I mean, choice? 
Yeah, well, you know, a handful of years back, I started, it was like a run with comedians where like five or six of them I knew got DUIs. And I just started looking at myself like, ah, shit, I sit here in the same, I have three, four beers. I can, I have a tolerance. I get a, I get a buzz. But even if I'm not fucked up, I know that if I drive home and, and a dog runs out in the street or a kid or something, it doesn't matter. I've been drinking. I'm getting a DUI. And I watched a girlfriend of mine at the time get a DUI. It cost her 10 or 12 grand. She didn't have a car for a year. AA classes, all this shit. Like the time, that's the other thing. It's not just the money. It's the time that you have to put into this DUI. And, um, yeah, I smoke. I smoke weed, but I... I I mean, I'll go two, two, three months without having a drink. It's and but it's I'll have the same six pack in my fridge for eight or nine months and not even have one. It's it I had a beer last night. I, had a yeah. I like a good cold one every now and then. At the store last yeah. night. I love nice. the taste of beer. Alcohol, I have a problem with more than one beer. I have a problem with. But can you have one? Yeah, I do it all the time. Because I've had a lot of people come on the podcast. I could do one and say, an hour before I go on stage. So by the time I get off stage, I have no misunderstandings. Right. There's no misunderstandings. I will never have a beer and get in my car. I couldn't no. handle it. I can't handle it. I can't. If a cop gets behind me, I lose my mind. I can have a body in the trunk and 20 kilos of coke in the trunk and drive perfectly. It's amazing. I have nerves of steel. Give me a cocktail and a cop gets behind me. I completely fucking lose it. Well, that's the thing about weed. Like, adrenaline will override a high, for a marijuana high, immediately. When I go to the comedy store at night, I'm not high. I get high when I'm down there, and by the time I get off stage, it's gone. Right. I never have weed. Listen, they gave me a privilege in this state. They've given me a privilege that I could even drive with weed in my car. I don't drive with weed in my car. I don't like smoking in my car unless it's, it's me and Lee when we get to the ice house. Yeah, we pull over, we open the windows, right. and we smoke, and then we add a car, car out. We have a privilege. I don't ever want to abuse that privilege. I don't want to be the one to abuse that privilege. Yeah. So they let us smoke. You can smoke all the weed you want in your backyard. You can smoke all the weed you want in your fucking house. Just open the goddamn windows and put an incense stick out. <laughs> but there's no reason to be driving down the 405. No. Smoking so, a I see people do it all and then day long. You get long. caught, yeah. you get in trouble, and you feel fucking and assholes like that done. ruin that's it for DUI. the rest of us. It a is DUI. a DUI. So that's the problem. See, in Maryland, we have DWI, which is driving while intoxicated, and then also DUI, which is on anything, pills, anything. But here, it's all DUI. Like, there's a specific breakdown in Maryland for alcohol and then everything else. But here, I mean, I had a buddy of mine, right? This dude. So he had this old uh, pickup truck, Ford uh, short bed, and um, the gas gauge was always wrong on it. It always read a half tank wrong. And I believe me, I've taken the fucking thing out for a push up and down La Brea before. Hopping in, pushing it to the next light, hopping in, pushing it down past Melrose, hopping in, sweating my balls off. And one night, He's helping his buddy out at the equestrian center in Burbank. He was in the horses. He's got a cowboy hat on. He's got spurs on. And he's down. at. He's headed to the beach for a party. And he runs out of gas. And he grabs a gas can out of the back of the truck. And he starts walking on the 10. And the police see him. So originally they stopped to pull over a pedestrian on the highway. That's the initial pullover. He's probably, I don't know, 50 yards 60 yards from the truck at this point. He's got a gas can in his hand. They're like, where are you going? And he's like, oh, I ran out of gas. I'm going down the hill here to get gas. And they smell alcohol. On him. So they arrest him. They give him a DUI. And uh, I he calls me. He's like, guess where I'm at? I'm like, jail. He's like, yep. And he's making friends with all the cops. He's going to poker night the next fucking week. And I told him, I go, why didn't you just say we had an argument and I fucking bailed and you were stuck walking with the... I would have gone to court and done that for you. I'd have been like, yeah, we got an argument. He's a fucking dick. And I, I got out of there, but they got him on it. And then he had to move to New York cause he's an actor and he couldn't drive out here. He could not get the audition. So he goes to New York and he has to do his AA classes in New York. And he's in there with lawyers and everyone that they, they're all telling everyone they're telling you, make sure your prescript. If you have any kind of painkillers, you better have that prescription in the car with you, not just get a copy of it. And cause they're going to pick you up. They're going to take you. So this one dude, this fucking idiot, 
drinks. I think it's like a case of beer he has, and he he needs more. So he lives above a liquor store. He goes down liquor stores closed. He goes up a block or two. Walks. Drives. Right? Gets beer, pulls back in. The cops pull right behind him and arrest him. Okay? Liquor store was open the whole time. The motherfucker pulled on the wrong door. The other one was unlocked. This motherfucker would have never got a DUI or anything. I've heard DUI. It's so fucking stupid. This is why. Stupid. I act the way I do. Because you're going to get a DUI when you least. That's right. Expect it. When you least fucking. A thousand dollar cab ride is worth it. It's worth it. I love. When the Lancashire, they have cops. You pull up to the cop, and then 10 feet from you, there's a tent. And there's two Indian nurses taking blood out, and there's 10 cars lined over. I love pulling up to them, looking at his eye, and going, what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, license, registration, have you been drinking? Do I look like I've been drinking, officer? I just left the comedy store, and they'll go, oh, my God, we know it. I love it. I love it being able to pull up to them. And laughing in their yep. face, like you got nothing on me. There's nothing in here. Yeah. There's not, not, not even a fucking gum wrapper. Man, There's no alcohol. Time. There's nothing. This was right at the end. That girl I was seeing, literally the day she was relieved of her DUI, the year end of all of it and everything. I'm, I go to a fight party. It was, uh, it was Pacquiao, Ricky Hatton. Remember, he knocked him out. He knocked him out. In like I want to say the first thirty seconds. Right, or so. It right, was quick. Right. Well, I'm drinking, thinking this is going to be a long fight. So I'm drinking, I'm drinking. I drink up till the the, the fight before the main event, and, I, and I'm done. Now I'm going to watch this main event that's going to go all 12, and then I'll be good to go, stay another hour, and I'm out of there. And Pacquiao knocks this motherfucker out quick, and the dude lost money, so he kicks everybody out. All right? I get in my car. I drift, drift down the hill. I make a right on Wilshire Boulevard into... A DUI checkpoint. I'm like, here it fucking is. She just got off hers and I'm going to get it. And I've definitely been drinking. I shouldn't be behind the wheel. And I pull up and I see the math. You know, you start doing math because they're one go, one over. One, and I'm oh, doing yeah. the math. I'm like, oh, yeah. oh, I'm, oh yeah. I'm getting pulled over. Oh, I see yeah. the math, you know. And uh, they pull me over and he just stares hard in my eyes. And I'm nervous, man. I go give him my license. I drop the fucking thing and I'm like, oh, God. And he looks at it and he gives me, he gives me about three of them. And he goes, all right. And I fucking pulled over around the corner and almost shit myself. Like yeah, I no, was terrified, terrified. But the thing about alcohol is adrenaline. On, if you're fucked up and they open that car door, you'll fall out. If you smoke a little weed and you're scared, you you can cartwheel down that middle of the fucking line. Like that uh, adrenaline over <laughs> weeds. Like, see you later, man. Smoke, smoke me later. Cops are behind us right now. I'll see y'all. I jumped right out of here. Yeah, right, it's Bro, like, I'm out of here. I got re- weed that jump. I'll see you back at the crib, man. <laughs> you, ever open, you ever go to your door and there's a cop and you're smoking? Yeah. The high jumps right out of your body. Oh, you, God, can even, dude. you can even see it standing next to you yeah. going. <laughs> Just he slowly slinking back. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. I don't get. The only time I get sizzled is early in the morning. <laughs> I watch before I work out or late when I get back from the comedy store. So when you, you like it when you work out? No jujitsu, but kickboxing and lifting. Yes. See, I don't like the. So when I, I like to smoke and go hike or something like that where I'm not. It's the it's the counting repetitions when I'm high that makes me like when I get to five, I feel like it should be 50. I'm like, that's all I'm at. You know what I mean? It's some it really makes me focus. And when I'm outside without I'm listening to music, I'm just hiking these canyons and stuff. That's when I really enjoy it. I, I've never been uh, I, I've never enjoyed smoking weed and lifting weights because of the counting involved. I was <laughs> it ruins it for up. I was really skinny, bony shoulders. And my mom wouldn't let me lift weights. I was 15, so I would take the sliding door off the hinges and put it on two chairs, and I would get those sand weights, and I would lift them and hide the weights on the fucking two-by-fours and <laughs> you shit. You were something else, dude. And then when I realized what real lifting was, that's when I didn't really, I didn't take to it too much. Yeah. There's <laughs> <laughs> that sushi right there. Let me get all taste of that. <laughs> I didn't really like it. And a friend of mine one day, you know, when I realized it was bench press and incline and <clears throat> bent over rows and T-bar rows and a push and pull technique, 
and you got to do this four times a week. I was like, this blows. But then it became what basketball was. Like, I respected basketball. And then one day somebody told me, you don't smoke before you play. And I'm like, no, why would I? And they're like, oh, my God, it feels like you're flying through the air. That's all I needed to hear. <laughs> yeah, right. I started yeah. smoking, and then I started hooping. I could hoop a little yeah. better. And with working out, like, if you definitely hate working out, take two hits off a pipe before you work out. Get good music on your little fucking Yeah, I love, I love getting outside and like that. That's what you do. Yeah. You know, it's a shame that I kickbox inside and I go to jiu-jitsu inside. But there's days I'm like, I'm not going to one of those places today. I got a punching bag in my backyard. I got three or four kettlebells. I got club sticks. I got a ball. I got a jump rope. And I inhale that fucking vitamin D. There's nothing like a little bit of vitamin no. D when you're working out. Yeah. You get that natural suntan from the sweat because your sweat works as a suntanning fucking thing. I love, I love all that aspect of it. Me but too. the bottom line is it's induced by the smoking weed. I don't think I'd enjoy working out as much if I didn't get high. Jiu-jitsu, you got to think too much, and I'm on my back. I got to go in there sober. <laughs> yeah, but I, the I, Muay Thai, I, right. there's a guy at Muay Thai that when I pull up in the mornings, he's smoking in his car. Really? Before he wraps his hands, he start, he smokes a blunt. And he he's 50-something, 40-something. He goes, this is the only way I can do it is if I don't think about what I'm doing. And you don't think about it. You don't think about it. You focus on breathing. Yeah, see, it's you the, focus on your day. That's While the way it is, it, hiking. You focus on breathing, yeah. and you focus on your day. What am I doing after this, and how much better am I going to be that I did this today? Also take time, like, during those moments to appreciate, like, all right, let's focus <laughs> on what's fuck yesterday, fuck tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow, no. we already know, is going to be a shit storm. Let's think about all the positive shit today that we've got going on and what we've done and focus on that because you, you get bit by a rattlesnake right now in this fucking canyon and you're dead, you know? Yeah, that's why I don't like hiking. I've seen a bunch of them up at Fryman, but I go oh. to Temesco. I probably can't now with those fires. Just, but I like, that's a real fucking hike down there, man. You know, when I was like a junior in high school, we would jump the fence to a cemetery, <laughs> knock over the gravestones, and there'd always be a little snake in there. And then we'd put them in a jar and then take them to school the next day and chase girls and shit. <laughs> and I remember one day I was chasing a girl with a snake and the snake shit. Like a little bit of shit and yeah. it wet my arm. It was just a little snake shit. Oh so God. last week I got to go to my mother's grave. And when I went last, I always go visit her. But when I, when I went in March, it's This snowed. year? This year. Yeah. I went March 20th to do Nyack and for the release of uh, what's his name's book. And. I didn't go because it snowed a foot of snow. So when I went this time on Friday, it was fucking just, it was like a pussy in the 70s, hairy as shit with grass and weeds. So I had jeans and sneakers on, and I got on my hands and knees and just started ripping weeds out, you know. I don't even know what the point of the fucking story was. Snake under the tombstone. Yeah, while I was ripping the things out, I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> yeah, right. Whoa, yeah. wait a second. Let me watch my. So I kicked it in there a little bit, and I started ripping it, and I looked, and then I cleaned it out, and I was tempted to push the tombstone <laughs> to see if there was a snake <laughs> under there, because that means your mother's in hell. Like, if there's a snake under there, it means your mother's in hell with Satan, <laughs> lighting the cigarettes and shit. But I don't want to know if she's in hell, so I just left the tombstone alone. I wiped it down with my sweater, but it was so funny because I was smoking a joint. For years, I would go to my mother's grave and just smoke a joint and talk to her. When she first died, I was there four times a week, and there was no gravestone. It was still muddy. You know, you mm -hmm. have to wait for the uh, yeah. grave to settle a year before ground. you put a thing on it. And then after a year, they put the gravestone. So when I pull up, I see a high-low worker, like a guy that digs trenches out. I see him, and he's on the phone, a black dude. I don't say nothing. When I sparked that reefer, it must have smelled good because he's <laughs> Ears, I'll call you back. <laughs> yeah, his ears perched up. I bet. And he saw me on the floor ripping the grass. And he's like, can I help you, brother? I said, man, you work here? He goes, yeah. And, and he goes, you, man, you look familiar. I said, yeah, whatever. What's your name? And he told me whatever his name was. I shook his hand. I go, you work here? He goes, Who's, who is this? I goes, my mother. I grew up around the corner. He goes, yeah. He goes, God damn it. A motherfucking TV star right here. You know, we started talking, and then I said, listen, do me a favor from now on. Can you mow this for me? And he looked at me, and I went in my pocket, and I gave him three 20s. 
I said, take care of this fucking grave. And he went over, he wrote the plot. I go, just trim it a little from time to time. Because I even took the bricks out. I had, like, bricks around it. Yeah. So, like, grass. Can't eat. Mm-hmm. He goes, leave the bricks. I'll fucking put the the zip, zip whacker in there. So, it was kind of weird that while I was ripping all that up, I thought about all the times I would go to the <laughs> yeah, cemetery. Right. And kick over the fucking tombstone. There'd be a snake under there. I don't know why I thought of that. My, uh. Here's a fuck. My brother was big into snakes, man. Like, he would catch them in the yard, bring them in the fucking house. Uh, there was one time we went to the doctor with my younger brother. We're probably elementary school, uh, middle school, maybe sixth grade, seventh grade. And uh, he, my brother's inside. We said, we're going to wait in the car. And my other brother reaches in his fucking pocket, and he pulls out a fucking snake. And I'm like, what the fuck? Where'd you get that? He's like, it was in a bush outside uh, when we were coming. I'm like, yeah, how long has it been in there? He's like, the whole ride. So one day, it's my turn to cut the grass. And we had the same uh, ride mower in Can't Buy Me Love, the snapper ride mower with a bag catcher on the back, okay? And it's summer. It's hot as fuck. It's humid in Maryland. It's my turn to cut. And back then, you know, it was before driving. So that was driving. You know what I mean? You got to, you got to cut. You like to cut the grass. And um, about four yards, four backyards up, I, our buddy Jeff lives there. And I see my brother and him with a big trash can, and they're standing back from this pine tree with a broom, and they're hitting the fucking pine tree like this. And I know, I got my headphones on with the cassette. I know they're getting a snake out of this tree. And I'm our backyard square, I'm going around and cutting it. And as I come up under our, our deck right here, my brother's standing there with about a six-foot black snake doing it like this, and he's acting like he's going to, Throw it on my on me. I'm like, don't fucking do it, dude. And I go back, forgetting about it or whatever. And the next time I come around, I feel something slap across the back of my motherfucking neck. And I look over here, and there's a black snake looking at me like this. I said, ah! I mean, high pitch. Ah! I grabbed it by the neck. I threw it on the fucking <laughs> ground. I put that blade down. My brother said, don't do it. I rode over that motherfucker, chopped that thing up in 100 pieces, dumped that motherfucking bag thing out. So there's your motherfucking snake, you dick. My brother was ruthless. I could deal with, listen, I could deal with snakes to a certain size. Like, what do you, what's, what's too big? The boas and the anacondas just kind of can rat pick you up. Some fucking guy in the yard fucking around, I leave alone. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I had a friend that played for, who the fuck did he play for in the NFL? His name was Chad Brown. And he hung out with a guy. It's funny because Chad Brown also was very good friends with that receiver from New England I told you about that used to hang out at Swanee's and you used to go, you know him? And Chad Brown was... Uh, you half, mean half, linebacker at Tippett? No, 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 he was, oh, okay. uh, he was a, uh, a wide receiver from New England, a tight end, and he won a few Super Bowls. Ben Coates? Oh, uh, Fourier? In the beginning, Christian Fourier. Christian Fourier and that guy were best friends, but he took his girlfriend. Uh. And they became enemies, so... When I lived in Boulder, towards when they were in college, he sold weed for a living, Chad Brown. At first, I had an intermediary guy, and then one day he goes, listen, just go over there. Chad knows you're a comedian. And I was just starting out. I was no comedian. But I remember going over there, and he'd have 20 snakes, three of them rolling around the floor. Al? Yeah, no, 20 in cages, like, you know. But a couple of them out on the floor. Two or three of them. Like what, pythons and boas? What, all that shit. And he'd tell you, be careful because one of them <laughs> be got careful. away. <laughs> don't stand next to that chair because there's one that's loose. I don't know if he's under there. I don't want him to bite you. Oh, my God. Every time I went to buy weed over there, it was like going to fucking snake jungle. <laughs> <laughs> You're out of your fucking mind, man. Yeah, fuck snake that. Snake jungle. You went to Baltimore a couple of weeks ago? I'm going, I'm going this weekend. Is this goes up tomorrow, right? I'm there on 17th and 18th. I got uh, shows at Jimmy's The Famous. Uh, sold out Saturday, Sunday night, 730. There's still some tickets left. And how are you taking the whole family home with you? No, I did that in the summer. This time. I know. I remember I talked to you and you said you were taking your son somewhere. Well, my daughter I took back in the summer. Uh, my stepson I'm going to take to see the Chargers Ravens out here this year. But this time, I, just because it's so much going on, it's just me going back for the shows. And you have a new special coming out. Yeah, I got a new album coming out. Uh, it's available for pre-order right now on iTunes, Amazon, Google Play. It drops November 20th. It's called Get a Hold of Yourself. Uh, did it with a great label, Blonde Medicine. Uh, it'll be available on Spotify, Pandora, and everywhere November 20th, wherever you get good and comedy. And podcast started. 
Yeah, that's going to come up too. I can't really say much about that yet, but uh, definitely have a new podcast starting. If you're already subscribed to the Craft Fuse, you can stay right on that feed because the new show is going to pop up right there. But yeah, yeah go get that album. I- I'm actually making the shows in Baltimore an album release party. It, it doesn't drop till uh, Tuesday, November 20th, but the people in Baltimore are going to be the first people in the world to be able to get it, and I'm really excited to be able to do that. I think that's really cool. And everything else is going well. In everything your life. else is great. You're my friend. You call me. You check on me. I love you. Thank you for having me on to do this. Hey, man. Uh, we're brothers. You fucking kill me, dude. This is what we do. You know, when I see you at the store, you make me really happy. That Same. I get to see you out. You know, it's so weird how your priorities change over the years. Like, I'm getting so old. 20 years ago, I went out to become a better comic. Now I force myself to go out so I have human contact. You know, we were yeah. talking about it with Brody the other day. And every time I go down there, as hard and difficult as it is, like in my head, once I hit Laurel Canyon, I, I'm ready. And yeah. I'm ready to see somebody, Sebastian, or last night I watched Chris D'Elia. I watched Bert go up in front of me, yeah. and then uh, he brought me up, and I had to bring up Theo. Yeah. So it's all of us. It's it's you know the circle of us that you go down there, you know, and I had to follow. I had to follow you the last time I went up the store. Just a couple weeks ago, I followed you. But I didn't know why, because I was there all night. Yeah, they were looking for you or yeah, something. Like I was you, there yeah. all night. I would have closed out. I would have followed I didn't, you. You know what, care. dude? When I heard it, I was like, Shh, nobody's got stories like that, motherfucker. But it made me work harder, and I did really well. Good. And uh, it made me dig in deeper. And I appreciate I don't mind working hard, man. I grew up working hard. I'm a hustler, too. So yeah, like, all it does is make me better. That's all it does. I mean, dude, your joke about you don't get sick because you eat ass and swam in the Hudson. I was just talking about it today in the Hudson River, dude. There's there's probably some fucking truth to the your immune Me? system, bro. This dude, Johnny Lopez and Mike Astley's went fishing <laughs> one time in the Hudson River. And we ended up catching an eel. An eel. Ooh. Stop farting on me. We ended up catching an eel. It bounces and I ricochet it right off the chair. So it goes to a 45 degree <laughs> angle oh, are you? right to his nose, right? So we caught an eel, and there's a grill. That little park down by the Hudson River has little grills. Yeah, those little uh, that you rusty gotta, you fucking, gotta, you, you bring your own coal and yeah. shit. Yeah, I know. You got to be crazy to eat on those. You're going to get fucking something <laughs> right off the bat. We cooked the fucking eel on there. We didn't know. We chopped it up, and we ate like its heart and shit. Jesus. And after that, my change, my life changed forever. Like, I wasn't getting sick like the rest of the kids. That did it, I didn't huh? have bags under my eyes no more. I recovered quicker from doing cocaine. Like I could do cocaine for 48 hours. It'd take you 42 <laughs> days to recover. It may take me one day to recover. An eel from so, the Hudson did it. I believe that. <laughs> fucking, and they're electric eels. They're the ones that electrify yeah, yeah. you in the middle of the fucking night. You get a twitch oh, in your fucking shit. neck for the first month after you do it. <laughs> it's funny. The other day I took my daughter to the park. And she's all about the fucking monkey bars. You know, she's getting strong. Hanging upside down and well, shit. Well, now right? she's starting to hang upside yeah. down. But to hang upside down, you have to do it over the concrete. So I went up to like a man. I go, can I talk to you for a second? I go, look, I admire your fucking admiration. But do it over the fucking dirt. She goes, why, Daddy? Go, that's concrete, that's dirt. If you land in the dirt, you'll be okay. I landed on the concrete. I had a twitch for a month. She's like, what's a twitch? And I kept going like this. She's like, what do you mean? For a day, she kept going. Daddy found the concrete, and he had a twitch. I swear to God, though, yeah. I landed neck first on the concrete. And you just twitched? At the playground at 205 West 88. I was knocked out for like a second. That was the first that started. The, that my, explains a lot. My dad, my dad died with the first sign of PTSD at three. This fucking knocked How out. old? I had to be five or five. six. When this this might have been the genesis I had to be right five or six <laughs> when I landed on the base of my spine and the back oh. of my head. I saw a couple stars. I heard some voices. <laughs> voices? I heard, I, I heard a bunch of electricity going through my body. Like I had fucking gotten caught on an electric fence and sing sing uh. or something like that. And the next thing you know, I woke up, dog, and everything was moving real fast. I didn't, I didn't tell my mother, but for a couple of days after that, I had like a little fucking. You just twitch. I had like a little twitch reaction. So I went to like fucking like a like a carnival. I went to a carnival and got on like a seesaw or something. A little. <laughs> we the dress. twitch. I told her you'll be twitching, or you'll be holding the ball, oh, squeezing shit. with your mouth open. You know, don't fucking come crying <laughs> to me. Do it over the fucking sand. So if you fall, it's a lot lighter. Uh, hell yeah. 
you look at your kids and you're like, you already know when they're going to fall. Like I was telling a lady, I did listen, these are controlled things. I enjoy controlled falls. Like my daughter likes to run back and forth in the living room. She's going to crack her head. I see it already. It doesn't take a dummy. But at least it's a controlled fall. It's different than falling off a building four stories. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. get six stitches in the yeah. living room. It ain't no big no. deal. You're in the living room. We'll put some ice on your head. We can take our time. We ain't got to run red lights. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you, 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 you <laughs> run fall. red lights. Yeah, next thing you know, you're running red lights. Yeah. She's going to die. Anyway, uh, I want to thank you, Ryan, for coming on the fucking yeah, show. Thank you. It's been a long time. Uh, I know that... A lot of people, the stigma was don't come on Joey's show because you'll test positive for heroin. <laughs> I'm not a Is that the stigma? Oh, for a while, the what show was taboo. People, I'll never forget Chris D'Elia called me one day, like, really serious. Like, listen, you know I don't mess with that stuff. I hear that you can't even touch the microphones, that everything's bugged up the teeth. Come on, like, dude. Bro, people were petrified. Listen, of back in the day, I tell everybody, because when you when your first introduction in, into the studio, you were like, I got LSD up over top of the door jam. You had all the old school shit there. But see, there's legends of like Segura having to take a car service home. Like people get scared to come here. Yeah. Do you remember when I had the LSD over the fucking wall? That's old school. Yeah, that's I old school I had a grandma shit. blow behind me. Look, peace. Look at that picture right there. Somebody came here to give me fucking something, and they gave me a grandma blow. I hid it behind Lee's picture. <laughs> I left it behind there. Came some cops came. It was Lee's. <laughs> And one day somebody came into the office and said, I can go for a bump. I go, I got you. And I hit Lee's picture and her Coke Rock fell out. Fred, Fred Sanford tap it twice. And, and, Lee's, and Lee's like, how come it's got to be behind my picture? <laughs> yeah. Because you got a clean record. So you really that was a rumor if you even leaned up and touched the mic, you could test bottom. Oh, my God. Heroin. I remember people not calling me <laughs> the back. Who getting tested for heroin you gotta, anyway, you, you by the way? Remember fucking, <laughs> at that time, fucking Sarah Tiana went down. The one chick ended up at the hospital. Hey, Sarah, then, then once, what's his name? Walked oh, out of the studio. Oh, she had an edible? Oh, yeah, and then once his name, Owen Benjamin ate Didn't an Paulie freak out, too? Paulie freaked yeah. out. Paulie see the devil. Now he wants to come back. I can't let him back. <laughs> once you leave, the, we're, like the, we're like the haunted kids. <laughs> once you leave, you can't come back. Oh, that's great. I love it that people were scared. Like, people were actually like, that was a yeah, rumor. That would great. tell me to my face. Like, hey, Joey, we just can't get on the podcast. Like, I can't be on all those drugs. My wife is pregnant. You know, shit like that. They were petrified. But now, you know what? We don't need edibles no more. We had one the other day, but it was guess, yeah. <laughs> it was guess, guess, hey, 16 milligrams don't do nothing to the mule. You know what I'm saying? You got to show up with a heavy artillery to kill us. Uh, shit. But anyway, you guys are great. Thank it was you so great much. seeing you, man. You too. You're always family. You're always welcome to you come too, on the show. Brother. And once you got your path podcast go and let me know and i'd love to come on you're coming some nasty stories of uh of uh this fucking cop that i can't break wait his balls. all right i love you thank you very much i love much. you brother thank you and don't forget i want to thank ryan sickler again great fucking guy i want to thank the christ killer but most importantly i want to thank you guys listen my church the night uh my show the night before thanksgiving is sold out but i'm back at the irvine improv friday night 9 45 fucking tremendous the church all-stars will be with me. No names, no names, but we're going to have a good time. 9.45, Irvine, you're going to be bored to death. You're going to be sitting there all day Thursday with hemorrhoids, eating fucking turkey. But if, listen, no traffic, no nothing. 9.45, you're in Irvine. So if you're in the, in the area, next Friday night, 9.45, Joey Diaz and a fucking bunch of savages at the Irvine Improv. But before I want to get off, I want to give a shout-out to my beautiful sponsors. Look, you're losing your hair. It's It's not good. Maybe you suffer from erectile dysfunction. That's not good. Look, 66% of men lose their hair by the age of 35, like I told you in the beginning of the show. You see their hairline slowly starting to move backwards. Any bald spot yet? How do you feel? How are you going to feel a year from now when it's business as usual up there? I ask you, do you want a bald spot to pop up or do you do want to do something about it first? Do you want your hairline to recede or do you do want to do something about it first? Me? I go to 4 It's a one-stop shop for hair loss, skin care, and sexual wellness for men, if you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm saying? Every once in a while, the pipe don't work, or the pipe is working, but you want it to work a little better. You're going out with your friends. Boom, 4 is there for you. Number one, Hims connects you with real doctors and medical-grade solutions to treat your hair loss. Well-known generic equivalents to name-brand prescriptions to help you keep your hair. No snake oil pills or gas station counter supplements. 
prescription solutions backed by science. How him saves you money is no waiting room, no awkward person, doctor visits. You save hours by going for forhims.com. F O R H I M S dot com. It's easy. You answer a few quick questions. The doctor will review it. He'll give you a call. He'll prescribe what you need. And the products are shipped directly to your door. Nobody knows nothing, not even your wife. You know what I'm saying? So do me a favor right now. My listeners, the church family, you get a free, you get a trial month of hymns. A trial month of hymns for $5. Five dollars right now while today's last. Listen, you can't go another year losing your hair, and you can't go another year with a rectal dysfunction. Go to the website for full details. See what Hims has for Hims has to offer. This would cost you hundreds if you went to a doctor or a pharmacy. I'm hooking you up for five dollars today at fourhims.com slash Joey. Again, that's fourhims.com slash Joey. One more time for the cheap seats. That's fourhims.com slash Joey. Listen. Time is running out, man. Time moves fast in this life. And you got to do some investing. You got to do some planning for the future. You One day you're going to be 55. You're going to be a broken man like me. And you got no fucking savings. So this is one way to get the party started. Robinhood. It's an investing app that lets you buy and sell stocks, EFTS, options, cryptos, all commission free. They strive to make financial services work for everyone, not just people with money. It's not. It's a non-intimidating way for the stock market newcomers to invest for the first time with true confidence, man. I mean, it's simple and intuitive. It's got a clear design with the data presented in an easy-to-digest way. Me, I like how easy it is. Listen, I ain't no Phi Beta Kappa. But the app works tip-top, Magoo. I've already done a few moves on there, and it's tremendous. The value of the Robinhood app is this, the cost. There's no commission fees. Other brokerages will charge you up to $10 a trade, but with Robinhood doesn't charge commission f- fees. You trade stocks and you keep all the profits. It's easy to understand charts and market data. You place a trade in just four taps on your smartphone. Four taps. Robinhood, the web platform, also lets you view stock collections. The 100 most popular sectors like entertainment and social media and curated categories like female CEOs and analyst ratings of buy, hold, and sell for every stock. You learn how to invest as you build your portfolio. You discover new stocks and you track favorite companies with a personalized news feed. Custom notifications for price movements for price movements so you never miss the movement, the moment to invest at the right time. That's key because in life, timing is everything. Now, Robinhood has given the church family a free stock like Apple Ford or Sprint to help build your portfolio. Sign up at church, C-H-U-R-C-H dot Robinhood dot com. That's church dot Robinhood dot com. This is the way to go if you want to mess around with stocks and get your portfolio started. Go to Robinhood. Go to church dot Robinhood dot com. Again, I want to thank Ryan Sickler. I want to thank the Christ Killer. But most importantly, I want to thank you guys for being the best family I've ever had in my life. I'll see you motherfuckers bright and early. Monday morning, tip-top Magoo, ready to go. Have a great weekend and stay black and stay out of harm's way, motherfuckers. I love you and I need you. Without you, I got who gots. Have a great weekend.